चलो ओके कर रहा हूँ चलो मेरे को लिंक भी भेज देना फिर बाद में ओके सर क्योंकि कुछ क्वेरीज आएंगी तो मैं लिंक पे देख लूंगा ठीक है ओके हेलो फ्रेंड्स आई एम डॉक्टर अजय यादव सो विल डिस्कस सम क्वेरीज व्हिच आर रिसीव्ड वेरी फ्रीक्वेंटली फ्रॉम स्टूडेंट्स इन लास्ट से टू मंथ्स और सो actually there have a lot of queries so uh, i try to pick up the important queries and uh, just formulated in the form of uh, mcqs some uh, queries were just single one liners but however i try to make it mcqs to have a proper and better discussion over it fine uh, so i'll just uh, solve these queries however uh, in last 5 minutes uh five ten minutes you can still post your queries i'll check in between if there are queries we'll try to solve those queries also okay so please feel free to send your queries so let's start with question number 1 allergy in immediate perioperative period is due to depolarizing muscle accents antibiotics latex non depolarizing muscle accents so this is something very new because until very recently it was proven uh means it was there that muscle accent used to be considered as the most common cause of anaphylactic reactions however recent studies have found that the most common cause is antibiotics so that makes it really very very important questions uh, from recent advancement point of view so current day practice you can say the most common cause of allergic reactions or anaphylaxis is antibiotics not the muscle relaxants in fact muscle accents are now third so still i can say the most common cause is antibiotics and even if antibiotics is not there in the choice then second most common cause is latex muscle accent is now even third so that is something new and something very important question number 2 a 46 year old male patient was given subarachnoid block with bp was again heavy by anesthetist after 10 minutes he was found to have bp of 72 by 44 mmhg and heart rate of 52 per minute on checking the level of block it was found to be t6 what is the likely explanation for bradycardia high spinal intravascular injection drug toxicity vasovagal shock c spinal was given and after 10 minutes patient develop bradycardia in fact patient develop hypotension also so this clearly indicate that the level of block has ascended enough to block the cardio accelerator fiber which are from t1 to t4 cardio accelerator fibers you know are from t1 to t4 now they say level of block is up to t6 now you will say okay up to t6 then why uh, and cardio accelerator fibers i told you is t1 to t4 what do you mean by that see level of block we are checking what we are checking sensory block and sensory block you know is two segments lower than autonomic block which is two segments lower than motor block so if i say sensory block is up to t6 that means level of motor block will be up to t8 and that the level of autonomic block will be up to t4 that means cardio accelerator fibers are involved one thing second thing is <clears throat> otherwise also there occur bradycardia in uh, <clears throat> spinal anesthesia why normally whenever there is hypotension there occur tachycardia but in spinal anesthesia in spite of hypotension you do see bradycardia and the reason is because there occur sympathetic block and the sympathetic block leads to parasympathetic core dominance leading to bradycardia and on that if cardiac related fibers are involved so see normally we say t6 so that doesn't mean it is actually t6 is definitely will be somewhere around t5 t4 also so that definitely lead to involvement of cardiac accelerator fibers producing bradycardia so the most common cause is high spinal a now look at the other choices intravascular injection intravascular injection if happens <clears throat> then 
this picture will not be after 10 minutes it will be immediately patient will collapse and it's not bradycardia it will be severe hypotension or maybe unrecordable bp and cardiac arrhythmias which may be even ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation leading to cardiac arrest so obviously it's <coughs> not an intravascular injection similarly drug toxicity will also present immediately if it is overdoses or maybe after some time but drug toxicity also will not present at that level of block is getting high and patient is having hypotension and bradycardia so drug toxicity also doesn't appear to be picture <coughs> and vasovagal shock only occur at the time of injection so when you give injection sometimes patient goes in vasovagal shock so that will happen before giving spinal anesthesia so most appropriate choice of course is high spinal and what exactly is the high spinal actually high spinal is a arbitrary term when the level of block is above the desired and that is causing some problem to the patient then we say that patient develop high spinal so it's a, just an arbitrary term question number three <coughs> an intubated patient kept on tps later develops breathlessness an x-ray chest shows white out right lung what are the most important step of management positive pressure ventilation bronchoscopy chest physiotherapy nebulization so this is a common scenario that we see in uh, icu patients so <coughs> patient was on tps means patient was on trial of weaning means uh, although nowadays you know for the trial of weaning no people are not using tps directly you can uh, wean from uh, wean the patient from ventilator however still many people they are going tps trial tps trial means you disconnect the uh, ventilator and connect the patient to tps so from one end of the tps there will be expiration like uh, say this is a tps so one end obviously this end will be connected to endotracheal tube and this end say is for expiration and this end will be connected to oxygen so tps trial so during tps trial this patient develop breathlessness and secondly x-ray chest shows white out lung white out lung in this scenario usually occurs because of the secretions secretions can clog bronchus and if secretions are large enough they may completely clog uh, the right bronchus so here right bronchus has been completely clogged block which lead to uh, atelectasis uh, not atelectasis you can say yes uh, <coughs> in uh, complete white out atelectasis and in fact white out lung so in that case obviously <coughs> one of the step is that we can give chest physiotherapy but in this patient i don't think chest physiotherapy <coughs> only would be a good idea we have to immediately remove the secretions we have to suck out the secretions and to suck out the secretions obviously that can be done only under bronchoscopy so best is immediately get a bronchoscopy done of this patient remove the secretions and yes later we can give chest physiotherapy and if needed we can give positive pressure ventilation also but first we have to remove the secretions by doing bronchoscopy so the most important or first step i will say is the bronchoscopy and later yes if required i told you you can give positive pressure ventilation or obviously patient will require physiotherapy question number 4 <coughs> anesthesia of choice for cesarean section in a female with severe preeclampsia spinal ga epidural combined spinal epidural this is again uh, i will say new question or recent advancement and this query actually has been sent many times by uh, students so previously you know for eclampsia pre eclampsia we or pih we were not giving a spinal we were giving epidural theoretically in fact because epidural actually for cesarean is not feasible epidural you know takes around 10 to 15 minutes to all onset of time so that time is not possible moreover majority of the cesareans are emergencies we can't wait and secondly uh, epidural effect may be patchy 
which is obviously not acceptable in cesarean section so therefore uh, we were actually giving spinal for years and years we were giving spinal yes in a spinal you can expect sudden hypotension so you should be ready to manage hypotension that is uh, obviously no need no need to say that even that uh, uncontrolled hypertensive they go in sudden hypotension so that need to be done however uh, <clears throat> that can be very well managed and well controlled so therefore now for pih or preeclampsia patient anesthesia of choice in current day practice is spinal so you can expect this question and i told you you i saw many queries of the students pertaining to this very frequent queries because books were saying epidural previously yes we were saying epidural but current practice says it's spinal question number 5 a 2 year old boy is brought to op by his mother with mass producing from his umbilicus the recommended treatment in this case was surgical management which of the following type of anesthesia would be most ideal GA with IV induction, GA with inhalation induction, GA with intramuscular induction, regional. Regional is obviously ruled out. Two-year-old child will not allow you to uh, put regional anesthesia, and moreover, this is laparotomy. Uh, so patient, uh, this need to be done in GA. Now for GA induction, again this is very important, and you will see many questions pertaining to this. with a lot of queries from the students uh, <clears throat> with a lot of confusion i'll tell you actually just uh, listen carefully preferred method for induction is always iv first method of induction is iv irrespective of the age whether it's an adult patient or child preferred method of induction is always iv and adults we always induced by iv and nowadays most commonly used iv agent you know is propofol but the children the problem is that children will not allow us to put iv lines so first you have to uh, <coughs> induce them by inhalation induction so we induce them by inhalation induction and inhalation induction agent of choice you know is sevoflurane because it has got most pleasant induction so in that case we will be inducing the child with the sevoflurane and after that we will be putting iv lines but this is not the preferred method preferred method is always iv means many times the child children are coming to us with iv cannula in place so if iv cannula is already in place then of course we will be inducing with iv but if that is not in the, there iv cannula is not there then we have to go for inhalation induction and i told you inhalation induction agent of choice is sevoflurane If sevoflurane not available, then the second choice is halothane. Isoflurane and desflurane can never be used for induction because their their induction is very very irritating. So here the best ideal would be GA with IV induction. A. Okay. I know many students they tempt to have inhalation induction with children, and that questions really become tricky. Question number six: You are preparing to set up for anesthesia in an off-floor location in the intervention radiology suit. Uh, the radiography equipment is consuming the limited space that is available in the suit, uh, and therefore the decision is made to double the extension tube length from the ventilator to patient table. According to you, what is the impact on dead space ventilation that would have occurred secondary to doubling the extension tubing length? Dead space will not change. Dead space will double. Dead space will increase by four times. dead space will reduce by half actually this is a common scenario in radiology uh, we have to really stand far away from patient i mean space is very less so either we can be there or anesthesia machine can be there so very often anesthesia machine is away and we we are using extension tubing so extension tubing will not increase the dead space see dead space in any circuit a very simple definition of dead space in circuit is the point where expiratory and inspiratory gases meet so it depends on the kind of the circuit like say uh, i say i am using bain circuit then bain circuit you know expiratory and inspiratory gases meet just at the end 
so bain circuit you know is like this so inspiratory gases will go through this inner tube and expiratory gases through outer tube so this is the point where dead space is there inspiratory gas, gases are meeting now this tube is this much or this tube is this much or this much or any length will not affect the dead space because dead space is this volume only similarly in a closed circuit dead space is beyond this expiratory limbs beyond this uh, valves this is a patient so this all is the dead space up to valves now this tube length you make any length is not going to affect the dead space because dead space is this much only so whatever length you increase dead space is not going to increase so it will not change seven cuff tube can be used in all age groups except premature newborn neonate none of the above this is also something very important that we research studies have proven that we can use cuff tube at any age except premature any age means you can use even for a newborn however yes still they say for premature we should avoid cuff tube so nowadays cuff tube can be used at any age even to a newborn also so premature will not be using else you can safely use cuff tube for any age group soda line color when fresh is pink white purple yellow soda line uh, <clears throat> you know there are in your books you will find different color indicators being used for soda line and actually many many different countries are using different uh, soda line color indicator but however you need not remember about other countries you have to only remember about india and in india you know that uh, soda line that is uses durasol which is pink when fresh and becomes white on exhaustion so soda line when fresh is pink and on exhaustion it becomes white so a question number 9 patient of blunt chest trauma has been started on mechanical ventilation which of the following is not correct about the initial setting tidal volume 8 to 10 ml per kg peep 10 cm plateau pressure 40 cm all of them nowadays this is again very important and you can expect a question on lung protective strategy now they say whatever the method of ventilation you are using whatever the mode of ventilation you are using does not make any difference important thing is that you have to follow the lung protective strategies so lung protective strategy means most important component of lung protective strategy is low tidal volume and low by definition mean 4 to 6 ml per kg of ideal body weight it's not the normal body weight it's the ideal body weight like if patient weight is 100 kg we are not going to give 500 or 600 ml what should be the optimal weight for that height so low tidal volume i will say most important strategy then peep peep you know is the positive and expiratory pressure and why we give positive and expiratory pressure so that alveoli remain open even during expiration but the problem of peep is that all the time peep is keeping alveoli open means intrathoracic pressure is always positive so that will increase the risk of barotrauma so therefore we have to begin with the lower peep and we should they say start with lowest that is 5 cm of water and then titrate now third thing how to monitor that you are not generating high uh, pressures so we have to measure plateau pressure 
you know that there are two kind of pressures plateau pressure and peak airway pressure peak airway pressure denote the pressure of airways while plateau airway pressure denote the pressure of alveoli and barotrauma you know occurs at the alveolar level so therefore we have to monitor plateau pressure and it should be less than 30 cm of water now these three things will prevent barotrauma so we are protecting lung against barotrauma second problem is that there can occur oxygen toxicity so fio2 should also be less than 60 percent or you can say 0.6 fraction of oxygen delivered should be less than 0.6 so these are the components you have to follow in your lung protective strategy so tidal volume 8 to 10 ml no peep 10 centimeter no we'll start we are talking of the initial setting so initial will be 5 and plateau pressure should be always less than 30 not 40 so that's also wrong so all of the above is wrong then question number 10 a 60 year old hypertensive patient on angiotensin 2 receptor antagonist is posted for hernia repair surgery. The hypertensive drug should be continued, stopped 48 hours before surgery, stopped 24 hours before surgery, stops, stopped on the day of the surgery. This is again something very important and recent change. All books you will see that it is given <coughs> that angiotensin 2 receptors antagonist or AC inhibitors, they should be omitted on the day of the surgery. But current evidence says or current recommendation says that they should be stopped one day prior to the surgery. So as per current recommendations, AC inhibitors as well as angiotensin 2 receptor antagonists that is losartan, valsartan, ebisartan should be stopped one day prior to the surgery. Other than AC inhibitors and angiotensin receptor antagonist, we will continue all antihypertensives will be continued. And why we have to stop them? Because uh, evidence showed that if you continue them, then patient can develop significant hypotension. Question number 11. <clears throat> A person was given axillary block with bupivacaine. Suddenly he collapsed. What is the treatment? Intralipid, fluid, vasopressor, all of the above. So patient was given axillary block with bupivacaine and patient suddenly collapsed. So the reason is that patient, the drug has gone intravascular. And in axillary block, it is common because you know that <coughs> this brachial plexus is all around the axillary artery. So your needle is always near the artery. So chances of intravascular injection is quite high. And if bupivacaine there occur intravascular injection, it can be lethal. Because bupivacaine is highly cardiotoxic. And cardiotoxicity can manifest in any form ranging from any kind of bread arrhythmia to any kind of tech arrhythmia including ventricular arrhythmia. And ventricular tachycardia are not so, fin not so infrequent after bupivacaine. So, <clears throat> bupivacaine, uh, if goes IV, then I told you it may turn out to be lethal event. So, patient requires succession. So, this patient has immediately collapsed. So, obviously, uh, management will depend what kind of arrhythmia is there. Like if there is, most often we see ventricular tachycardia. So, if there occur ventricular tachycardia, uh, then obviously we will be giving amiodarone. However, patient can collapse immediately. So patient may even require CPR. And of course, patient requires resuscitation. So resuscitation may be CPR depending if patient has arrested or patient require vasopressors or fluid if there is severe hypotension or <coughs> uh, if there is only ventricular tachycardia, then patient may require amiodarone because drug of choice now for uh, bupivacaine induced ventricular tachycardia is also amiodarone and antidote for bupivacaine toxicity is intralipid 
intralipid 20% and how this intralipid works this simply you can say uh, chelates or blocks the active form of bupivacaine simply binds to the active form of bupivacaine uh, preventing toxicity further toxicity so in this case patient has collapsed so intralipid definitely will be required and patient of course will require fluids vasopressor and depending on the situation patient may even require cpr or patient may require amiodarone so of course here will be all of the above question number 12 a 34 year old woman is undergoing general anesthesia for cholecystectomy after completion of the case the anesthesiologist turned off gas and notes that patient is recovering from anesthetic agent very quickly what are the most likely properties of this inhalational anesthetics high blood gas coefficient low blood gas coefficient high fat gas coefficient low fat gas coefficient actually two most important property of inhalational agent that you should know one is the uh, uh, <clears throat> minimum alveolar concentration which denotes the potency so two most important property is potency and uh, you can say uh, <coughs> blood gas coefficient so potency uh, depends on lipid solubility so if agent is more lipid soluble it will be more potent so potency is related to lipid solubility second property i told you is blood gas coefficient blood gas coefficient which also is called as blood gas solubility which is a indicator of induction and recovery so if a agent is less soluble in blood although it's little complicated but a very simple method to understand this is that if a agent is less soluble in blood it will be easy for for brain to extract it from blood so induction will be faster or if agent is less soluble in blood then obviously uh, uh induction will be faster so lower the blood gas solubility induction and recovery will be faster so this patient is recovering very quickly fast that means blood gas coefficient or blood gas solubility of this agent should be less so this agent should have low blood gas coefficient low blood gas coefficient let me see everything is going fine no technical issues or anything just waiting for the agent to finish okay so question number 13 first change in tracheostomy tube should not be done before 24 hours 48 hours 3 days 5 days uh you know that after tracheostomy stroma forms in 5 days so track first change should not happen before 5 days otherwise you may uh, you may create a false false track and false track in tracheostomy you know can lead to surgical emphysema which makes putting tracheostomy tubes impossible and intubation impossible and which can lead to death of the patient so this is very important that first change should not be done before 5 days so at least wait for 5 days however tracheostomy is more or less you can say will be covered in more detail in your ent section but uh, nowadays we are also frequently doing our uh, uh, <coughs> percutaneous tracheostomy and of course majority of the tracheostomy care in icu are done by us surgical tracheostomy is done by surgeons ent surgeons but percutaneous tracheostomy is done by us intensivist 
and of course care of trichostomy is done by us so if you want to change then first change should be done at least after five days question number 14 duration of spinal anesthesia can be prolonged by all except dose concentration adding vasoconstrictor none of the above now look at the question they have asked duration duration of an spinal anesthesia can be prolonged by all except dose yes if you give more dose duration of action will be prolonged adding vasoconstrictor adding vasoconstrictor to local anesthetics for spinal is not recommended for other reasons but if you add vasoconstrictor then duration will be increased however i told you vasoconstrictor is not added for spinal anesthesia because uh, there is possibility although that is uh, not common that this vasoconstrictor may produce significant vasoconstriction in anterospinal artery leading to anterospinal artery syndrome which can cause uh, uh, paraplegia therefore vasoconstrictor is not used for spinal anesthesia but if you use uh, vasoconstrictor for with the local anesthetic duration will definitely be prolonged whether it is for a spinal epidural or for any regional block concentration will not increase the duration concentration define the modality of block like if you are using lower concentration only sensory block will be there if you are using higher concentration there will be motor block like for example say with bupiva cane if i talk of 0.125 percent you will only see sensory block but if you use 0.5 percent you will see motor block 0.25 percent if i use still i will be seeing sensory block so the concentration defines that which modality is blocked not the duration means if i am using say uh, 2 ml of 0.125 percent or 2 ml of 0.5 percent it won't change the level of block it will decide whether the level of whether the block is only sensory or motor so concentration does not define the duration concentration define the modality of block so b 15 a 25 year old woman with mitral valve stenosis comes for delivery the obstetricians plans for normal vaginal delivery which of the following modalities of anesthesia should be given? Epidural, ep spinal, GA with nitrous oxide, combined spinal epidural. C, for normal vaginal delivery means painless labor. And for painless labor beyond any second thought, uh, the anesthesia of choice is lumbar epidural. So it's irrespective whether the patient is having mitral stenosis. Actually, see these mitral stenosis patients strain is very dangerous and labor strain particularly during second trimester can lead to a cardiac failure in these patients so for these patients we should reduce the load load we should actually uh, <coughs> prevent a stressful response in these patients so lumbar epidural will be an excellent choice and of course for uh, painless labor we are using epidural not spinal so not using a spinal uh, and a spinal actually is not preferred for i'm not talking of when a vaginal delivery i'm talking of otherwise also for mitral valve stenosis it's a stenotic lesion fixed cardiac output lesions so for fixed cardiac output lesions generally we avoid uh, spinal anesthesia because these patients will not be able to tolerate for <coughs> uh, hypotension and they will not be able to increase their cardiac output so lumbar epidural question number 16 second gas effect is related to is oxygen xenon nitrogen nitrous oxide what is second gas effect second gas effect is uh, <coughs> that nitrous oxide is increasing the concentration of inhalation agents so I'll just rapidly take this opportunity to explain you these effects. Uh, there are four effects you can say. One is uh, concentration effect. Second is augmented inflow effect. Third is second gas effect. And fourth is diffusion hypoxia. 
all these effects occur because nitrous oxide is given in higher concentration and you know that the concentration of nitrous oxide we are using is 75 percent means three fourth of the lung will be filled with nitrous oxide so what will happen say there occurs sudden uptake of nitrous oxide due to that concentration of nitrous oxide will suddenly decrease in lungs so say if 50 percent nitrous oxide has been taken up into the blood so mathematically we think that the remaining concentration of nitrous oxide should be half of 75 percent that is 37.5 but that doesn't happen because gases do not work on the principle of mathematics they work on the principle of concentration gradient so sudden uptake of nitrous oxide will decrease the concentration of nitrous oxide in the lungs so that will lead to indrawing of nitrous oxide from machine into lungs this is called as augmented inflow effect means nitrous oxide has augmented its inflow from machine now since more nitrous oxide is indrawn into the lungs so the achieved concentration of nitrous oxide in the lungs is higher than what we are expecting so this is called as concentration effect that means nitrous oxide by uh, augmenting its inflow has increased its own concentration concentration effect now nitrous oxide coming from machine will also carry inhalation agent along with it so <clears throat> concentration of inhalation agent will also increase so, so this is called as second gas effect that means nitrous oxide has in increased the concentration of other agent that is inhalation agent this is second gas effect at the end of surgery when you stop nitrous oxide lung will become empty of nitrous oxide so now the concentration of nitrous oxide is more in blood or tissues and lungs there is no concentration so nitrous oxide will reverse flow so from blood it will gush into lungs replacing all oxygen from there creating a hypoxic state called as diffusion hypoxia so simply all these effects occur because of nitrous oxide question number 17 correct position for the placement of endotracheal tube midway between carina and vocal cords just above carina just below vocal cords just touching the touching the carina very simple question of course uh, this actually vocal tube or you can say a uh, cuffed part of endotracheal tube i'll show you this also see normally this you can see this black mark so normally we keep this black mark at vocal cords so means around you can say this is this may be around six centimeter five to six centimeter of uh, endotracheal tube is in trachea and what is the length of the trachea from vocal cords up to carina around 10 to 12 centimeter so six centimeter below vocal cords or you can say around four to five centimeters above the carina so somewhere you can say at midpoint between carina and vocal cord not exactly midpoint it will be more towards uh, i will say lower third but uh, approximately in these choices you can say yes midway between carina and vocal cord not just above carina why because just above the carina if you keep and it go suddenly uh, it go little low it will enter the right bronchus and if you keep just below the vocal cords just little pull will lead to accidental extubation and of course you cannot touch the carina so best option is a 70 tetanizing frequency during neuromuscular monitoring 2 to 4 hertz 10 to 20 hertz 20 to 30 hertz 50 to 100 hertz i think this was the question in this year only uh, for neuromuscular monitoring you know that the most commonly we are using is train of four where we give four stimulus each of two hertz frequency but there are other modalities also like uh, uh, <clears throat> double burst stimulation tetanic stimulation or post tetanic stimulation single uh, twitch stimulation so there are many modalities that we are using so tetanizing we are using around 50 or 50 to 100 hertz so what actually is the use of this tetanizing frequency you know that the most important difference between depolarizers and non depolarizers is that the non depolarizers they exhibit fading that is one characteristic and second is they exhibit 
पोस्ट टेटेनिक फैसिलिटेशन और पोस्ट टेटेनिक रेस्पॉन्स वाई लुक एट द मैकेनिज्म ऑफ एक्शन मैकेनिज्म ऑफ एक्शन ऑफ डीपोलराइज आर कॉम्पिटेटिव एंटागोनिस्ट मीन दे ब्लॉक एट द सेम रिसेप्टर साइट एट विच एस्टेलिन बाइंड सो डीपोलराइजिंग मीन सक्सम इथोनियम सो इट विल एक्जेक्टली बिहेव लाइक एस्टेलिन प्रोड्यूसिंग मसल फैसिकुलेशन इन ऑल बॉडी मसल्स दैट यू सी ऑल्सो एज फैसिकुलेशन and then repeated <coughs> stimulation will lead the membrane to become refractory so that refractory period is a period of relaxation and if the membrane is refractory whatever a strong stimulus you give membrane will not respond what is the mechanism of action of non depolarizers they are competitive antagonist <coughs> means they bind to the same receptor site at which acetylcholine binds preventing acetylcholine to bind to the <coughs> receptor site and competitive antagonism you know is a pure number game if there are more molecules of <coughs> non depolarizer they will replace acetylcholine from their place and if there are more molecules of acetylcholine they will replace non depolarizer from their place now with this background in your mind say <coughs> you have given a muscle action depolarizer or non depolarizer now you give a strong tetanic stimulus of 5200 hertz normally we are using 50 only but they say you can use up to 100 so what this tetanic stimulus will do it will release acetylcholine from pre junction area now there is more acetylcholine available at neuromuscular junction now you give another stimulus that is post tetanic stimulus if you had given depolarizer will there be any response no because membrane is refractory so even if you have increased the molecules of acetylcholine membrane is refractory it won't respond but if you have given non depolarizer then increase acetylcholine would have removed uh, non depolarizer from their site and if you give a response if you give a stimulus there will be response so post tetanic response or post tetanic facilitation is also exhibited by non depolarizers d expiratory valve of closed circuit getting stuck in closed position will lead to hypoventilation barotrauma hypercapnia all of them okay this is also important question so which i get really very frequent queries and i think that was this was there in uh, aims last year or last to last year so this is how the closed circuit work just need to understand so this is say inspiratory limb and this is expiratory limb and this is the canister containing soda line and these are the two valves which maintain unidirectional flow of gases so this will be attached to patient so expiratory gases will pass through expiratory limb and from there pass through canister containing soda line which will absorb carbon dioxide and same gases can be reused now what they are saying here is that this valve is stuck closed stuck in closed position so what will be the consequences <clears throat> now you can very well understand that what will be the consequences co2 is not <clears throat> reaching the canister so it will accumulate in the patient and patient will develop dangerous hypercapnia secondly gases cannot go anywhere they are not getting exhaled into the atmosphere because it's a closed circuit and they are stuck here so that will build a significant pressure here leading to significant barotrauma and same gases are in circulation so if these gases are not reaching to the uh, inspiratory side so how patient will receive <coughs> inspiratory gases some fresh gases are added from air but it is a very low flow that is not enough so why we are using low flow because the same gases are being reused so we are not getting major chunk of gases on the inspiratory side so that will lead to hypoventilation so there can be hypoventilation barotrauma hypercapnia so all of that fine 
So the most important, if you ask me, all of the above is choices not given, then I'll go for barotrauma. Because <clears throat> for low hypoventilation, we can compensate by giving more gas flow from here. And yes, there will be hypercapnia, but more dangerous life-threatening complication is barotrauma. Hypercapnia is, is dangerous, but barotrauma is more dangerous. Question number 19. <clears throat> Patient was given halothane, develop hyperthermia and rigidity. Which other drug must have contributed to this condition? <clears throat> Succamithonium, fentanyl, rocuronium, atracuronium. So hyperthermia and rigidity means this is a case of malignant hyperthermia. And for malignant hyperthermia, you know <clears throat> that the most commonly implicated drug is succamithonium. However, malignant hyperthermia can occur with all inhalation agents and among inhalation agents, it is maximally seen with halothane. So other than halothane, obviously even <clears throat> more commonly implicated drug would be succamithonium. Which of the following investigations provide the most accurate prognostic information with respect to predicting, predicating risk of perioperative cardiac complications? ECG, echocardiography, dobutamine, stress echocardiography, coronary angiography, DSC. is <coughs> a very, you can say, important test from prognostic point of view because <coughs> dobutamine causes stress. And you know, surgery is a stressful condition. So, dobutamine, you can say, uh, produce a simulation kind of situation to see what happens to the myocardium if some stress is given. So, that is, you can say, some scenario <coughs> of surgery which is created by giving dobutamine. So, DSC, dobutamine stress echocardiography is very useful to tell <coughs> the uh, complications in the perioperative field. Eco may be normal, but whenever there is stress, there may occur regional motion, wall motion abnormality. So by giving dopamine, we are creating that stress situation which the patient is going to face in perioperative period. 21. <clears throat> if a vaporizer is used at high altitude, which of the following is true regarding delivery of inhalation agents? Output will increase, output will decrease, output will remain same, output will decrease only after 5000 meters. I think regarding altitude, I often get too many queries pertaining to this. So one or two things just you need to understand. Of course, you need not go in much details of altitude anesthesia. You all know what happens to the density of gases at high altitude that you all know at high altitude density of gases will be low low density means so gas density will be low so the consequences of low density of gases so the consequences will be that number one rotameter will under read low density means if you are set 8 liters or say 5 liters so density is low so it is showing 5 but actually may be going 7 if you are set 5 density is low so it will be more delivered more delivered gases means you are giving 5 liter but it is going 7 liter now say 5 liter is passing through vaporizer or 7 liter is passing through vaporizer gas passing will lead to more vaporization so, output of inhalational agent will increase, output will increase and third, th but you know that anesthesia depends on partial pressure, not on concentration. So, that's more physics, I don't think you would need to go in that much physics, but that depends on partial pressure, so not on con concentration, so net effect will not be really significant even if output is increases now potency what happens to potency there is pressure reversal theory of anesthesia means 
at increased pressure more mac is increased it means, means if you increase the pressure there will be more mac so at high altitude there is low pressure so there will be decreased mac and mac you know is inversely proportional to potency so you can say decrease mass mac means there will be increased potency so these things you have to understand motor rotameter will under it output will increase mac will reduce so mac reduce means potency you can say is increased one in 1000 <coughs> concentration of adrenaline is used with local anesthetics with cardiac arrest for anaphylaxis all of them above with local anesthetic it is one in two lakhs cardiac arrest one in ten thousand and for anaphylaxis one in one thousand if we are giving im and mostly anaphylaxis we are giving im if you are giving iv then it will be one in ten thousand but anaphylaxis almost always we give im so im concentration is one in one thousand c 23 a 30 year old trauma is posted for radius plating on history it was revealed that he took his lunch at 1 pm on further investigation it was found that his meal included butter chicken patient has agreed for brachial plexus block he can be taken for surgery at the earliest by immediately after 6 hours after 8 hours after 12 hours after 8 hours normally fasting should be 6 hours but if patient has taken fatty non-veg meal then fasting should be 8 hours so patient has butter chicken fatty non-veg meal so we have to wait 8 hours now somebody will among you will say sir patient has agreed for brachial plexus block so we are not giving GA your block can fail there is no guarantee that block failure will not be there anytime your block will fail or sometimes you start your surgery then patient start complaining after some time partial block patchy block then what you will do you have to give GA so patient cannot be considered for anesthesia region anesthesia if patient is not fit for GA because anytime block can fail and we may land up in giving GA so fasting has to be full 8 hours in this case in patient with drug eluding stent during cataract surgery clopidogrel should be continued stop 24 hours stop 3 days before 5 days clopidogrel you know has to be stopped five days before surgery. Clopidogrel five days. Twenty-five. A patient was brought to casualty with lacerated wood that required suturing. The wound was cleaned with cleaned and antiseptic precautions were taken before bupivacaine infiltration was given. Which of the following nerve fibers are most sensitive to the effects of infiltration? A gamma, B, C, A, alpha. I think maximum queries i get a student from on this concept and i'll tell you why what the reason see nerve block can be peripheral nerve blocks or central nerve blocks this is the reason for confusion peripheral nerve blocks the sequence is a gamma then a delta then a alpha and a beta simultaneously then B and then C. Even if they have not given the subclassification of A, then also A will be A, B, C. This is the sequence. However, for central luxal blocks, this sequence is B, then A and then C. This is the reason for confusion. We don't know whether central luxal block or peripheral nerve blocks. So if peripheral nerve blocks, A, B, C. If central luxal block, central luxal block means the spinal epidural then it will be VAC. If not mentioned, then consider peripheral nerve block. Because sometimes question you will find that they will not mention peripheral central, then consider peripheral nerve block and it will be ABC. But here, bupivacaine infiltration is peripheral. So obviously it will be ABC or A gamma. A. 26. For epidural anesthesia in labor, the level of block required is up to T10, T6, T4, L1. This is also very frequent queries that I see with the students. See, for painless labor, we just need to block 
the nerve supply of uterus and you all know that the nerve supply of uterus is up to T10. So level of block is up to T10. So this is for labor analgesia. But if they ask you for cesarean section, then level of block is up to T4. Why? Because in cesarean section, it's not only the uterus which is handled. Gut and peritoneum is also handled and peritoneal nerve supply you, you know is up to T4. So that is the reason. If they are asking for painless labor, yes, it is only uh, up to T10. Fine. But for cesarean, it will be up to T4. 27. Appropriate size of endotracheal tube for a 6-year-old child is 6754. And this again is an important question because in books you will find there are two formulas. Before we had different uh, formula for children less than 6 years and different formula for more than 6 years. But now there is a single formula and that is age which is in years divided by 4 plus 4.5 for all ages from 1 to 14 years. Now single formula. So this is 6 years, so 6 divided by 4 plus 4.5. So 1.5 plus 4.5 means 6 number to you. A. 28. A 30-year-old patient underwent humerus plating under supraclavicular brachial plexus block. The surgery lasted for around 2 hours and the patient was kept in recovery room for 1 hour. Now anesthetist wished to send this patient uh, to ward, not to ward, the gap should be there, to ward, which of the following he will expect to return first, motor, sensory, autonomic, all recovered simultaneously. Again controversial and the reason is why controversial, again whether it is peripheral nerve block or central nerve cell block. Peripheral nerve block, sequence of blockage is motor, then sensory and then autonomic. While for central nerve blocks, first to be blocked is autonomic, then sensory, and then motor. And recovery occurs in reverse order. Means for peripheral nerve block, first to be blocked, first to recover is autonomic, then sensory, and then motor. While for central nerve block, first to recover is motor, then sensory, and then autonomic. So here they have clearly given under supraclavicular brachial plexus block means peripheral nerve block. So in peripheral nerve block, first to recovery will be autonomic. C. Again, if not mentioned, then consider it as peripheral nerve block. If the question comes like that, that they have not mentioned the kind of block. 29. What the most common cause for hospital admission after daycare surgery? Nausea and vomiting, pain, bleeding, delayed recovery from anesthesia. This again is very important. I think that was the question also came recently. See, there are two, three things which is causing confusion in students. Daycare surgery means patient discharge same day. So, many times patient recovery is delayed. I will talk of discharge, not recovery. Delayed discharge. Like say we are supposed to discharge patient at 4 p.m. However, we are able to discharge patient at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. Second is patient is admitted. Means patient is not in a state that we can discharge the patient. So we have to admit. So patient from daycare surgery is going to IPD. Means patient is admitted. Second is patient went home. But there is readmission. Say next day or in the night even the patient came back. So this you have to see. Delayed discharge usual causes are anesthesia. Like if you ask me most common complication leading to delayed discharge is drowsiness. Patient is drowsy. So means delayed recovery you can say. Other causes may be yes nausea and vomiting or pain. So these are the reasons for delayed discharge. Patient is drowsy but after one hour, two hour he will become okay and we can discharge home. Or if patient is having nausea vomiting after giving one or two doses of say 
on densetron patient will settle and we can if patient is having pain give analgesic wait for half an hour one hour pain will settle and we can send the patient home so these are the reasons for delayed discharge patient getting admitted or patient coming back to hospital readmission is almost always from surgical causes and among surgical causes most often is bleeding so you have to understand because this question i think was asked recently this year or last year inict or uh, neat i don't remember so they have asked hospital admission admission means surgical causes that is bleeding third inhalation and aesthetic of choice for day care surgery halothane sevoflurane isoflurane desflurane sevoflurane now again immediately we'll jump to say that the fastest induction and fastest recovery is seen with desflurane desflurane has got lowest blood gas coefficient then why still we are using uh, sevoflurane for day care surgery for many reasons one is the cost the cost of you can say 1 liter sevoflurane is if around 35000 the same effective cost of desflurane will be around 1 lakh because the requirement of desflurane is 3 times mac is 6% sevoflurane is 2% so it effectively becomes more than 1 lakh rupees per liter cost if you are giving more drug means you are more exhaling into atmosphere so that will lead to environmental pollution so desflurane causes more environmental pollution thirdly desflurane has got irritating induction so chances of uh, laryngospasm bronchospasm is high and most importantly the difference in the recovery time between sevoflurane and desflurane is around 1 to 2 minutes so just for a 2 minute difference in discharge time you cannot spend that much money you cannot uh, lead uh, cause environmental hazard and you cannot increase the risk of complication in patient that is why desflurane in spite of having faster recovery which is just 1 or 2 minutes faster than sevoflurane we are preferring sevoflurane for day care sir and i think that is there time is actually over so still if you have any queries you can post it i'll just going to our youtube so whatever the queries i'll uh, just take the queries What's happening? Just a second. Okay. Sachin and the other Namaste from Nepal. Okay, Sachin and Namaste. How to learn? Ankit is asking how to learn anesthesia drugs. ankit there is no single formula to run, learn drugs just keep on reading and uh, keep on uh, uh, doing mcqs practice ocular cardiac reflex is seen during squint surgery manipulation of ocular muscles leads to uh, bradycardia that is ocular cardiac reflex mac is minimum alveolar concentration so mac is minimum alveolar concentration so minimal alveolar concentration is the concentration required to produce effect in 50% of uh, the uh, <coughs> subjects like if you are checking in human being skin incision is considered as a painful stimulus if you are checking guinea pig rats then tail clamping is considered as a painful stimulus so lesser the mac obviously more will be the potency any other queries okay thank you and my best wishes so i don't think any other query but still if any queries later also you can post on your facebook we will definitely try to solve your queries as fast as possible and thank you very much for joining okay i'm closing the session